How's it going everybody? So in this video, we're going to be discussing some of the major flaws in health science research. And this includes everything from nutrition science, this includes exercise science, sleep science, uh, disease prevention science, pretty much any type of science that has to do with humans as a biological organism and trying to figure out what uh, factors influence health, prevent disease, uh, how to most optimally program exercise uh, recommendations, nutrition recommendations, and what constitutes a healthy lifestyle, a healthy diet, etc. Okay, uh, so at a baseline, the vast majority of human beings who are uh, trying to use health science or nutrition science to guide their life, uh, most people have no clue uh what health science actually is what uh types of information can actually be taken away and extrapolated from these studies and how reliable these studies actually are most people don't know how to interpret science uh and they just don't know how to approach it and that's really bad considering so many people use it as like an appeal to authority like how many times do you see someone making a video stating their opinion about health Oftentimes, this can be very rational, right? Because you have the irrational health opinions, like the raw vegans, who are like, the body's, al the body's alkaline, and that can easily be disproven using science research. But then you have people who are like, yeah, actually, um, uh, in order to improve longevity, you know, eating more protein and strength training has been shown in the literature to have a pretty strong correlation with uh, positive out health outcomes in the elderly population. You have people in the comments saying, no, uh, the science does not support that. This acts absolutely wrong. It's absolutely disproven. And it's like there's nothing that's absolutely proven or absolutely disproven in health science. Anytime someone starts to talk in absolutes like that, immediately you should default towards, oh, this person doesn't actually understand the whole point of gathering evidence or scientific research. They don't, they don't understand science because health science does not work in absolutes. It's not work in proofs, okay? Um, but it's used as an appeal to authority. And then they're like, where's your scientific references? And it's like that is a completely backwards approach to uh, interpreting science, okay? Uh, that's just not what we're doing here. It is largely epistemology. It is largely f philosophical. And it's all about asking questions and developing discussion around the answers that we do have. Nothing is absolute. So anyway, let's start to talk about, uh, you know, some of the, you know, what what exactly am I talking about here? So um, first and foremost, the vast majority of science research regarding health, exercise, sleep, and nutrition is largely based on correlation and observation, okay? Uh, virtually, I'm just going to estimate over 90% of the research available, even the best research that uh, underlies our foundational understanding of, 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 of the human organism in general, is based on um, on it, it can't prove causation basically. So even intervention trials, okay, uh, even some in a metabolic ward, where all confounding variables, or not all of them, but the, as much as we can control, are controlled. There are still confounding variables in a metabolic ward that cannot be controlled for. You know everything from the thoughts and the mindsets to what somebody's pre-existing adaptations before they enter that metabolic ward are actually um, influencing. But anyway, uh, let's look at some primary examples of where correlation studies and observation studies are basically the number, the, the, what the entire paradigm is based upon. The first and most obvious one is actually sleep science, okay? So I've made so many videos about this over the years. I haven't made enough though. I really wish I should have because I feel like I was one of the very first people to start talking about the flaws in sleep science research. Um, and now people are starting to kind of talk about it. But we have these, I'm just going to say these uh, misguided ideas from people like Dr. You know, Matthew Walker, who wrote an entire book on it. His entire profession surrounds the idea that if you don't get eight hours of sleep a day, 
then you're going to die prematurely, basically. He, there's a lot of alarming, fear-mongering in his work where he's like, you're going to, you know, he said, like, people have smaller dicks if they don't sleep enough. Uh, you're cutting off 20 years of your lifespan if you don't sleep in his arbitrary recommendations. Uh, when in reality, uh, the vast majority of sleep science research is based on cohort studies. So, or, or more so not cohorts, but observations, uh, ob observational studies on free living populations, okay, where they take people who have, you know, under five hours of sleep a day who are just, that's a part of their, a natural part of their life, and you take people who have, you know, eight hours of sleep a day, that's a natural part of their life, and then 10 hours of sleep a day as part of their natural lifespan, right? Or part of their natural lifestyle, okay? These are people who are freely living in accordance to these things, and they're not like – it's not like they're entering a trial or, or a science research thing and changing their behaviors. Those people have already been living that way for a while, right? And so there, you have the, an observational study on people who their life just naturally – they get a certain amount of sleep, right? And they're in these different categories, and you see a pretty – it's such a varying degree of, of, uh, of health outcomes and, and, and effects from different sleep, uh, numbers, hours of sleep. It's funny that we even extrapolate um, hard, solid guidelines from these studies, but this is what most of these are founded on. And basically what you see is people who have, um, you know, even – eight and a half hours or more of sleep a day ha typically have worse health outcomes. They're, they're sicker, have more cancer, more heart disease. So people who, live, who, who sleep nine to 10 hours a day, they seem to have the highest risk of, of dying, basically, the highest mortality rates, the highest instances of heart disease and diabetes and all these other things and obesity, and the highest sleeping groups. And then you see in people who sleep under five hours uh, of sleep a day, also have high uh, negative health outcomes, but the people who sleep the least, they actually don't have nearly as, as negative of health outcomes as the people who sleep nine, nine hours or more a day in these observational studies. Now, somebody who has an IQ over 120, okay, and just for the record, I'm not bragging, but I think this is relevant. <laughs> Uh, I, my IQ is 149, 148 in the second grade, something like that, 148, 149. Anyway, um, to me, it doesn't make any sense that people just are like, oh, yeah, uh, based on this evidence, I must sleep uh, in that middle range. The sweet spot is seven and a half hours, and if I sleep any more than that, I'm risking dying, or any less than that, I'm risking dying. It's like – that's that and, and, and the people like Matthew Walker, like they're on record on TED Talks and shit saying based on this, if you sleep five, if you if you if you sleep less than six hours a day, you're going to have small gonads because observations, you know, like literally that was a finding in, in a study. It's like people who sleep less than uh, seven hours a night a day, they have smaller genitals It's like. You know, it reminds me of, like there was a study that uh, or an article with the with the headline that said um, people who drink their coffee black uh, tend to be psychopaths. <laughs> it's like you know, and it's just a study that showed um, uh, the on average uh, people who like their coffee black have more um, character uh, personality traits that are in line with with being a, a sociopath or whatever. Uh, and, and that's just uh, – and, and, but people take that as, oh, I don't date people who, who drink uh, their coffee black and plain because this study says that they're likely to be a, psycho, a psychopath or a sociopath or whatever, which I know are, two, are different things, but whatever. You guys get what I'm trying to say. Uh, it's, it, people think that they're fucking smart because they're referencing scientific literature or they're following scientific evidence and basing their life on scientific evidence – they think that that makes them superior, smarter, more intelligent, when in reality it's, number one, appeal to authority. Number two, it's actually not as sensible and rational as you think. <laughs> and number three, it's cognitively lazy to just be like, oh, the, you know, the evidence shows this, therefore I'm going to live my life based on that, when you haven't actually considered the – like what exactly are – is a context of these studies – 
And how exactly does that really translate to the real world? What's actually happening in the real world? People are seeing, are using scientific evidence, and they're, and it's actually a set of, a set of data using analytics and, and, and basically a set of averages based on a huge, wide range of, 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 uh, of, of populations and people who are living completely different lifestyles from each other. And there's a myriad of causes that are actually really at the base of what's causing these outcomes. It's not just, oh, I got five hours of sleep, therefore I have small gonads, or I drink my coffee black and that's what's making me a psychopath, or, or I'm a psychopath and because I'm a psychopath, it makes me like my coffee black. There, there, there may be no real actual causal link, mechanistic link between liking your coffee black and how many sociopathic uh, personality traits you have. You know what I mean? It could just be a correlation and it could a lot of people probably like their coffee black and also what type of people agree to doing a scientific study about coffee probably people for one who like coffee most likely don't want to ruin the taste of their coffee with fucking sugar and shit and number two they're probably more eloquent people whatever the fuck that word means you know never mind the point is <laughs> these are all speculation in my own biases but what i'm trying to get at is like um, the majority of these findings and the majority of, of these studies that actually are at the foundation of the majority of our understanding about the majority of health problems uh, are fundamentally based on speculation from observational trials that don't actually that a lot of times actually don't translate in the real world. So we're going to get really deep into this and I'm going to really solidify all of this here in a bit. Uh, but let's look at um, so what actually is going on in these sleep studies, okay? How is it that uh, people who sleep over, you know, eight and a half hours or more, and the more hours they sleep, the worse their health gets, how can these people who sleep the most have the worst health outcomes, way worse than the people who sleep the less? People who sleep under six hours a night have worse health outcomes than the people that sleep eight, but people who sleep way like way at the highest end have way worse health than the people who sleep at the lowest end. How is that possible? Well, I'll tell you how. And it's like, uh, this is what I was trying to say with the IQ shit is like, how the fuck do people not see this, right? Or, or at least ask questions and, 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 and look at this with skepticism. People are like, oh, he's not referencing science or that's not backed by scientific literature. I'm a skeptic. Therefore, he's full of shit if he's not in line with a scientific consensus. But then they're not skeptical about the scientific consensus when you look at the data, it doesn't make fucking sense. Like, when I see people identify as a, skept a skeptic, like, I think I'm the most skeptical motherfucker on the planet. With, listen to this shit that I talk about, right? But I don't identify as a skeptic because most people I identify as a skeptic, what that really translates to is they are, they identify with group think and with the consensus. And anyone who's outside the general consensus, who's not following the mainstream paradigm, that they are bullshitters, you know, it's like, it, it just, it's not, you know, scientific American or quackery.com. It's like a lot of times these people are, are the least skeptic people and they're really just relying on the consensus. Uh, anyway, what am I getting at here? Fucking healthy user bias is the cause, in my opinion. It's the explanation. Why healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias, okay? Google search that. Look that up on Wikipedia if you don't know what that is, okay? That is actually at the core of a lot of this observational trials, okay? So people who sleep over eight hours a day, typically, they are usually sick people, okay? People who sleep over eight hours a day tend to have be either be hospitalized. They tend to be more depressed, um... They tend to, to be overweight. They tend to have vitamin deficiencies. Uh, typically, when you are sick, your sleep is less efficient, uh, and you tend to be more tired and more fatigued. At a baseline, viral infections and all these things typically uh, cause people to actually sleep more as a result of being sick. Not that sleeping more causes them to become sick, okay? Also, when people are sick, they take time off work. They, there's typically this uh, dogma that when you're sick or when you have a, a disease, you need to uh, exercise less, which is actually false in my opinion. 
doctor's main recommendation is when you're sleep when you're sick or when you have a heart condition or whatever it is uh, to sleep more and get more rest so that you can recover. So the point is is reverse causation at play. The people who sleep more than eight and a half hours a day, okay, and this isn't always true, but this is probably true for the majority of the evidence on this. The reason why they have negative health outcomes is not because they sleep eight and a half hours or more, 10 hours a day. They have negative health outcomes probably from other things, like they caught an infection, they have heart disease or whatever, from, from uh, unhealthy eating patterns and things from the rest of their life. And that's actually causing them to sleep less, or sorry, to causing them to sleep more. That's what's actually causing them to sleep over over nine hours a day. And that's why we see people who sleep over nine hours a day in the scientific literature have the worst negative health outcomes out of anybody. Then when you look at people who sleep under six and a half hours a day, right, people who are claimed to be sleep deprived based on the, the scientific literature, that these people – have negative health outcomes. But why would that be in regards to unhealthy user bias? Well, because people who typically sleep less than six hours a day, these are usually people who are doing shift work, they're doing security jobs, they're doing, they're uh, working in prisons or, or as police officers, or they might be uh, nurses who are working at hospitals. And I, I've had clients who work, you know, 18 hours uh, with no breaks in between as nurses. And they, they might get a four hour break, you know, and then have another shift to go immediately after. These people are sleep deprived and uh, a lot of times they don't have time to eat real healthy meals, or at least that's what they say, right? They, they're usually eating more junk food. They are getting more food deliveries. They're going out to more fast food because they are living highly demanding lifestyles that don't let them sleep and don't let them eat properly, and they don't have enough time for exercise, or so they say. It's a lot harder and more challenging to live a healthy lifestyle when you are living such a demanding life that doesn't allow you to sleep uh, adequately. Okay. So what that is saying is, again, is it the fact that they're sleeping less that's causing their health out, health issues, or is it the fact that their lifestyle doesn't let them eat healthy and exercise healthfully because they're working so much, they don't even have time to cook healthy meals. They, they're always eating. They have to eat junk and fast food, uh, and then because of their highly demanding lifestyle and they don't have enough time to even eat healthy – they also have negative health outcomes from the unhealthy eating, and their lack of sleep is actually a symptom of their highly demanding lifestyle. The, uh, the lack of sleep is not the cause of their negative health outcomes, okay? So that's unhealthy user bias, and, and that's actually at play for the vast majority of our re of our. Uh, research on on biological you know human health and human uh performance okay so let's look at vegetable research here's another one right so um you can see so you know it's, this is a car the carnivore diet shit that people always kind of say but i think it's valid okay uh, so if we look at the majority of research on, you know, so you typically will see most commonly the people who eat the most fruits and vegetables typically have uh, the, the, he the best health outcomes on average. However, the, the uh, magnitude of effect of health benefits from fruits and vegetables are relatively small. They're usually uh, statistically significant within the context of the study, but on an, abs uh, an absolute uh, risk reduction, typically we don't see a major risk reduction uh, in absolute terms outside of the context of the study design. Uh, regardless, though, you typically on average will see people who eat the most fruits and vegetables typically have the least negative health effects. And people who eat the least fruits and vegetables in these population studies, and especially cohort trials, you typically will see uh, have the worst health outcomes. Okay, so there's a lot of problems with this. Number one, what are we considering a fruit or a vegetable? Are we considering ketchup and french fries a fruit and a vegetable? Because in many uh, studies, they do actually uh, consider that a fruit or a vegetable. What about fruit juice or vegetable juice? A lot of times, they'll consider uh, certain like highly sugar-laden fruit juices as a fruit in these studies. So that already muddies the waters, okay? And usually they kind of lump red meat consumption in with, 
you know, chicken fried steaks and hamburgers and, and even pepperoni on a pizza sometimes. Okay, so first of all, before we even get into this, if you look at NHANES data uh, and, and the UK shopper study, and if you look at studies that show people who uh, that actually show what people buy at the supermarket and where people are usually getting the majority of their calories from, whether that's from buying or consumption or the average uh, a household. So studies that are actually showing what people are eating, that where the calories are, are being consumed in the majority of the population, which by the way, these are the populations of people in these studies, okay, that show more fruits and vegetables, whatever, yada, yada. The top 10 food groups almost always, okay, so for sure the top five food groups, I have this on my Instagram, okay, uh, from Inhanes. They show uh, processed carbohydrates and just processed foods in general. Almost always it's hyperpalatable food. It's things like pizzas, pastries, pasta, pizza, I already said pizza, hamburgers, uh, not even hamburgers. It's mostly pastries, pastas, uh, pizza. Okay, and uh, prepackaged baked goods and shit like that. Those are the majority of the caloric intake. Okay, uh, and it shows uh, food consumption data from multiple age groups. Okay, uh, I think I think hamburgers might have made like the top four in like the the twenty year old population of people or some shit like that. Uh, and then there was like chicken from like chicken Alfredo or something in the in the um, five five to twelve year old group or some shit. Barely any meat in those uh, in in those food. And I'm just I'm just throwing that out there. They're not not there's no there's no like dishes and 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 calorie sources in the top ten calorie sources from these studies that show um, vegetable dishes. Okay. Let alone even meat dishes are very rare. It's mostly uh, processed carbs and processed vegetable oils, okay, that are being consumed in a package of hyperpalatable food, palatable foods. And I'll say to the, um, you know, if it fits your macros, you know, group of people or the evidence-based nutrition people, the majority of these foods are hyperpalatable. They're high-calorie foods that just make you want to eat more. Most people, mo a lot of these health problems that we're seeing in people probably have nothing to do with fruit and vegetable intake at all, just judging from the food consumption data we have. It's probably mostly high calories, um, are the result of uh, you know eating more and moving less, maybe, right? Just uh, overall too many calories. And then secondarily, the food choices, which, by the way, more protein, obviously, and more fruits and vegetables has unique benefits for a wide variety of health benefits. Food quality matters. But I'm just saying at the baseline, just looking at what people are actually eating on a practical level, already we can make some you know, judgments about what we're going to find in these people who eat the most fruits and vegetables in these studies. Okay, So now let's look at the – so that's the bottom up, right? That's like what are people actually eating, right? And obviously if you go to the grocery store and you see what people are eating, you basically see the same shit, okay? It's rare that you see people who are eating, you know, a pound of vegetables a day, you know, who are also eating a shit ton of pizza and all this other stuff, right? Uh, very, very rare. They're not going to go out and just, you know, they're going to spend all this money on like broccoli, power greens, salad greens, uh, you know, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables. They're going to spend, what, $20 a day on pounds of, of, of plant foods? And then they go out and they freaking eat pastries and zebra cakes and, and the junk food that we typically see as like actually underlying health problems, right? Refined sugars, refined foods. You don't see people are eating the most fruits and vegetables, you know, uh, wasting money on fruits and vegetables and wasting money, uh, wasting their health on refined foods. This just doesn't happen. So anyway, again, healthy user bias, okay? People who eat the most fruits and vegetables, a lot of times in these studies, these are people who are eating upwards of six to eight cups of, of broccoli and, and cauliflower and carrots and, and citrus fruits a day. That's crazy. That's crazy. You know, two pounds or more of, of, of these of fruits and vegetables. Who the fuck eats over two, two pounds of fruits and vegetables a day? Not somebody who is going to go out and eat 
McDonald's and French fries and, 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 and sodas. These are typically people who are already living a healthy lifestyle. And if you've listened to my other uh, videos talking about the majority of the population and, and getting them to actually abide by any healthy lifestyle change at all, uh, to get people to even start to eat more fruits and vegetables, not to say that that's going to cause better health outcomes. Most people are so have such a hard time just showing up to the gym consistently when they're paying for personal training. Getting them to follow any kind of diet paradigm at all, even to just track their food in a food journal, is so hard. So these people who are eating lots of fruits and vegetables a day, make no mistake, these are in the top, you know, I don't know, 97th percentile of the population of health. These are the, the, the in the top 5%, or maybe I'm exaggerating here, but... There are special people who are living the healthiest lifestyle possible, okay? People don't just eat, you know, over eight cups of fruits and vegetables and then also, you know, do all, you know, these are people who are living the healthiest lifestyle possible. So what I'm trying to get at is most of the studies that, that show um, people who eat the least fruits and vegetables have the worst health outcomes and people who eat the most fruits and vegetables have the best health outcomes – it's almost always healthy user bias. It's literally just these are people who are all, you know, they're free living people who willingly eat these fruits and vegetables because they're also avoiding alcohol, avoiding cigarettes, which, by the way, they try to control for, you know, health in confounding variables by just controlling for smoking and cigarettes and exercise. That, that is a whole nother rabbit hole to go down. We also have to control for sugar, refined sugar, refined foods, and shit like that, and then calorie intake, and no studies to do that. And typically what you see is people who they're, – these are people who are avoiding junk food. They're, they're engaging in lots of healthy behaviors. They're avoiding a lot of unhealthy behaviors. They're pro usually higher in socioeconomical status, which we know also uh, influences health status. Um, a lot of times have low stress or they have a better way of dealing with stress and tolerating stress. They're usually mentally healthier okay? because you kind of got to be to have that kind of discipline. Uh, and, and they take – you know, supplements or whatever, and, and it goes on and on. And they expect to be healthy usually, and the expectation effect in placebo is really big. So, you know, and then the people eat the, the least amount of fruits and vegetables in these studies, they usually don't give a fuck about their health, right? They're these YOLO motherfuckers who do whatever the fuck they want and are following intuitive eating to the highest extent, right? And just letting their food signals guide their behaviors and their addictive qualities, smoking cigarettes, whatever. They don't give a shit. Okay, and they're eating all the freaking sugar, okay? So I'm sorry, but that is a summary of the majority of evidence. And so then we try to say, well, we have intervention trials that show this and that. Okay, look, um, the same thing goes with sodium, saturated fat, and meat intake, okay? Not to say that, you know, there are LDL trials and stuff that are pretty convincing, but what we do actually have uh, a 12-month intervention study, okay? It's called the A to Z weight loss study, okay? And if you only look at the abstract, you'll see basically it basically compares the Atkins diet to the Ornish diet. That's a meat, a meat, salt, and, and saturated fat-based diet, the, the, the Atkins diet, compared to the plant-based vegetarian low-fat Ornish diet that also includes exercise and statin drugs and other things, okay, but it's a low-fat vegetarian diet with exercise recommendations, and it's low-sodium, low-salt, no-fat, and then they compare it to the, the zone diet, which is like a Mediterranean diet, basically, and they compare that to the dash, uh, an earlier variation of like the American Heart Association diet, okay? And if you just look at the abstract, it just says that the Ornish di or the the Atkins diet lost three times more weight with, and this is without controlling for calories or anything, okay? But then if you look at the full study, the full text, there are graphs. They actually tracked uh, blood pressure, blood sugar, you know, uh, hemoglobin A1C, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and weight loss, and a variety of other health metrics. 
uh, at baseline, at two months into the study, at six months into the study, nine months and 12 months at the end of the study. So they literally measured blood markers all throughout the study. If you look at the full text, okay? Uh, this study was fund founded by the government, by the way. It was not funded by the Atkins or anything like that. And they show the Atkins has two, two to three times improvements in all health markers studied throughout the entire uh, study. And it gets better as it goes on. Okay. And uh, I, I think I forgot the other, the other diets didn't really do very well. And the Atkins diet, they were instructed to eat as much as they wanted as long as they kept net carbs pretty low. And they slowly added net carbs back over the course of the, of the study. And they had dietitians to help them for certain diet groups. And I think the Atkins group was just counseled over the phone and they are given a, a copy of the Atkins for Life book. Okay, So I'm not saying that there's – again, the whole purpose of this entire video is that nothing is really conclusive in health science. And we just have to look at the evidence, you know what I mean, and then relate it back to what we actually see in the real world. And I'm trying to just say that we can't just use science as a guideline, okay, as the first step in trying to figure out what to do for our health, okay? I think we should do the opposite. We should look at what's actually working in the real world, then use science to try to help us understand it. But anyway… You see clearly that people who are doing everything the wrong way in this intervention trial, this is one of the best intervention trials we have. 12 month study, uh, mark, blood markers are, are tracked in the full, in the full text. Um, and you see the exact opposite. We don't see people who are eating the most fruits and vegetables and the least amount of meat, least amount of saturated fat, least amount of salt having the best health outcomes. Literally the only metric that the Atkins diet, uh, was uh, was bad was LDL cholesterol, and we know and from metabolic ward studies, the more saturated fat people eat in a dose dependent response, the more LDL someone has. The question isn't does you know, uh, the question is does LDL have a causal risk for heart disease? Okay, a lot of people even in the in the low carb communities and the Atkins communities don't even know uh, what the LDL debate's about. They're like, oh, eggs don't raise cholesterol. It's like yeah, they do, actually. It's saturated fat, not cholesterol. Uh, anyway, so it's pretty clear observational studies showing people eat the most fruits and vegetables, uh, having better health outcomes, is healthy user bias. And the same thing goes for, oh, more meat, more disease. Like, there's, a, that's not, there's not even a clear correlation for that one. But studies done out of Asia actually show the more red meat people eat, the more the better their health outcomes, probably because of socioeconomical status. Also see in Hong Kong, and you know, this is recent studies, so who knows what they're eating twenty years ago. They eat uh over a pound of meat per capita, uh and uh they have had like on average the highest life expectancy in the world for like the last ten years or something like that. You know, and I have videos showing Japan, they eat, they're like the world's largest egg consumption. And in China, they're the world's largest fish consumption. And in Okinawa, the group of centenarians that live the longest uh, actually ate the most fish and they were not vegans. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot of like data points that show the health science recommendations and what we extrapolate from observational trials is not cut and dry. But too many people kind of try to act like it is. All right, I've made so many videos about this already. If you have a question that you, you know, if I didn't explain something or if you think you see like a hole in my argument, please actually post specific questions in the comments and I'll get back to you. Uh, there are a lot of things I haven't talked about in this video that solidify us even further. So the other thing is you see uh, gr like Facebook groups and YouTube videos and Reddit groups and uh, just a, a growing amount of people who have found that they reverse the vast majority of their illnesses, whether that's symptoms of type 2 diabetes, even coronary artery calcium. I've seen people that had a high coronary artery calcium reverse it following a, a, a freaking carnivore diet. Um, people who have had uh, autoimmune illness and all these things reversing it uh, using a carnivore diet or at least resolving their symptoms. Maybe there's other things that are underlying the autoimmunity, but 
and I don't advocate carnivore. I'm just saying this is more evidence in the real world that what we see in observational studies are probably not true. Um, you know, and then the mainstream, they try to say, oh, it's probably a placebo effect or, you know, or these people are lying. They don't actually try to examine, well, why the fuck is removing plant foods having such a powerful effect for autoimmunity, right? I mean, type 2 diabetes is obvious. They're eating less carbs. They're probably eating less calories. So that's regulating their metabolism. There's nothing special about low, about low carb or carnivore that necessarily is reversing diabetes but like even coronary artery calcium they're eating mostly meat and fat it's like how the fuck does that happen right uh, ldl is usually all over the place it varies depending on the person so i'm just saying like there's there's a lot more going on than what a lot of these you know assumptions we make from scientific evidence actually echoes then if you look at Free living hunter gatherer societies, yeah, sure, they have an average lifespan of 40 because they don't have modern medicine to like deliver babies. So they have a really high infant death rate. And, you know, they are living in really harsh environments with cheetahs and jaguars and, 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 and bacterial infections. So a lot of these people, they've been studied and they show uh, rock bottom uh, levels of, well, okay, so basically extremely low instances of heart disease of of cancer of type 2 diabetes sure maybe that's because they're eating like very low calories and their food sources are scarce um but they also sleep the least because they have to protect the women from like super cute tigers and they have to go out and hunt um and they're eating a large amount of saturated fat and animal foods but they're also eating a shit ton of plants and basically they're opportunists and they eat whatever they can find but you'll typically see uh None of the mainstream recommendations uh, reflect what's actually seen in hunter-gatherer societies, but it could just be because they're dying off way before they can ever acquire cancer, whatever. All right, so let's look at exercise science research, okay? So most people that follow my channel probably don't, aren't into strength research and shit like that, but here's the thing. Typically in science for exercise science, what you see is uh, training to failure generally, uh, supposedly, it generates too much fatigue and does not uh, induce any better strength gains. Uh, and you need to train submaximal, leave a couple reps in the tank to get optimal strength outcomes. Same thing goes with muscle gain. Okay, that's typically what you see in, in, in the exercise science research. Also, they show uh, more frequent exercise sessions are generally best for most people. All right, but at the same time, in the real world, you, you see a large amount of, of humans who try to do submaximal training the way that echoes the science research, and they actually start to lose strength, or they don't make any progress in, in muscle size or progressive overload. And there's a lot of people that actually find if they train once a week and they do uh, exercise training sessions to failure, also known as high-intensity training, not to be confused with high-intensity interval training, uh, you know, kind of Mike Mentzer, uh, you know, high intensity, uh, training, uh, even like Jim Wendler five, three, one, it's basically one top set to failure followed by first set less, uh, which is a back down set to failure. There's a lot of people that actually find their best gains ever from, from the high intensity interval or the high intensity, uh, failure training of Dorian Yates or whatever. And all these like high intensity training people. Um, but then you have Renaissance periodization who I like to follow, who recommend, uh, reps in reserve, a couple, you know, using two, two reps in the tank and then only doing one kind of week of failure training in their last, uh, week of the mesocycle. And, uh, that tends to work for the vast majority of the population. So then you have on the other extreme people who train who work up to a, a max one one set uh, one uh, like a, a max single in powerlifting, like a one rep max for squat, even one rep max deadlift and bench press every single day. That's actually what I've been doing the last like two weeks, and they see the best gains that they've ever seen in their life. Okay, and that's actually been my experience. And there's a lot of people out there, even people who have elite level strength numbers, who do a one rep max 
every single day. And they only do it for maybe two, three months before they switch back to a submaximal, uh, higher volume, less frequent approach. And they, and they see the best strength gains in their life. So what I'm trying to get at is that in exercise science, you don't see that the science is right every time, all the time either. You see um, that there's recommendations from like a large pool of evidence uh, from the free living population and you get an average kind of like of what you can expect if you train a certain way. Same thing with nutrition. If you eat the plant-based diet, you'll probably get a kind of similar health, uh, health outcomes as you see in the research. And if you sleep uh, based on you know seven hours a day like that's echoed in the research, you'll probably get on average about the same health outcomes. But mechanistically, if you follow something completely different from the plant-based diet that's shown in the research, or you sleep completely differently than the seven and a half hours a day that's shown in the research, or you exercise or train completely differently than the sub-maximal moderate frequency, moderate volume approach that's shown in the research, you could have the best results ever if you do the opposite or do something completely different than what's shown in the research, or you may have the worst results. The point is the research doesn't show you what's actually going on. It just shows you on average if you follow the research, you'll probably get a similar kind of result. But that doesn't mean that that's the only way and that that's the right way or that negative health outcomes happen if you do something else, right? Within the research, you have to understand it's mostly correlation. Exercise science is usually done. They usually will take... Uh, a group of, of untrained people and put them on an exercise program and pretty much anything is going to make them stronger. Uh, exercise training, something else people don't think about is the gains and the uh, adaptations you get from exercise training is entirely reliant upon what you're previously adapted to. If you take someone who's, adapt, who's, who's been training five sets of five squat and deadlift uh, for the last five months and you put them on a five sets of five program for a training protocol and a science study, they're probably not going to really get any th any phenomenal strength gains because they've already been adapted to the modality that they're being researched on. But if you take somebody who is sedentary and has never trained before and put them on a five sets of five in a science study, they're going to get amazing gains because they're adapted to doing nothing. Also, if you take someone who's been doing three sets of five for the last five months and you put them on a five sets of five strength protocol in a study, they're going to get amazing strength gains too because they're only adapted to three sets of, of, of 10 previously in the last five months. Because they're adapted to something different, their body will change because you're switching the program. But these studies, they don't say, oh, these people previously, what their previous training was like. Because that's the most important thing. We know that training adaptations are basically you take something, you take somebody who's done some you make someone do something they've n that their body has, has never seen before and it will adapt like crazy. You know, even if you've been doing strength training before, if you, if you change your program completely after a number of months, the body is now forced to change and make gains. So literally almost none of the science on exercise science is relevant. Very, very little. We can make certain things like, oh, well, if you, you know, increase in the frequency, you know, seems to work sometimes or whatever. Eating more plant foods might make you healthier. Might. So anyway, let's kind of wrap this up because I have somewhere to go. I'm going to have to make a part two. But basically, um, the other thing is like plant foods. Even further, you see, um, you know, we don't know what the fuck in plant foods actually supposedly makes people healthier. Right? This whole idea that plant foods are magic because people who eat the most plants, right, in these studies have the best health outcomes – we think, oh, it's the, it's the vitamins and minerals in them. Well, if you look at people who supplement vitamins and minerals in the average population, you don't see any health benefits at all. And a lot of times you see increased rates of cancer and other things. What about antioxidant supplementation? Pretty much all studies that, that are done on vitamin C supplementation, beta quarantine, etc., there's no unique magical benefit in people who have been supplementing antioxidant supplements over the long term. And sometimes you see an increased rate of smoking or cancers – or sorry, not smoking, but lung cancer or, or, or colorectal cancer in the groups that take the most antioxidant supplements. So that doesn't say antioxidant supplements are bad, but it's pointing to the, to the fact that they're not magic either. Because if antioxidants were so healthy, you would see an improvement in – these population studies. 
So population studies are not good for making health recommendations or showing what works even. Population studies, though, are very useful for finding out what probably is not true. That's why it's okay to use population studies to kind of debunk something and say, oh, that probably doesn't work, right? Like, for example, carnivore people say, oh, vegetables are fucking toxic, right? If vegetables were so poisonous, we wouldn't see people eat the most fruits and vegetables have the best health outcomes. We just wouldn't. We would see people having symptoms of poison or toxicity and the people eat the most fruits and vegetables. So that's why population studies are okay to kind of use for information. But if they're not, you can't be like, oh, people eat the most fruits and vegetables have the best health outcomes. Therefore, if I eat as much fruits and vegetables as these people in this group, I'll have the same outcome, right? So I got to leave, but <laughs> there's a lot more to talk about here. Um, you know, polyphenol supplementation also in the research doesn't show benefits. So what is, what is the magic of fruits and vegetables that's giving people these health benefits? People try to say the fiber. We don't see fiber, uh, fiber supplementation increasing health outcomes. Why is it that when we eat the whole fruit and vegetable, it, it gives us best health outcomes? You know, people try to say, oh, there's something magical about eating in the food complex. I'm sorry, but it just sounds like we're, we're reaching for a conclusion that's not actually there. We want to believe fruits and vegetables are so magical and healthy. But in reality, there's something else going on in these studies that we're not looking at. Okay? It's not the magic of the foods that are being eaten. It's not the magic of sleeping eight hours a day. It's not the magic of training a certain way in, in these exercise science studies. Okay, It's the fact that there's something else going on, healthy user bias, another kind of correlation that we're not seeing. And we're trying to be like, oh, it's the sleep. It's the amount of sleep that we're getting that's causing the health outcomes in the sleep study. Or or the, the, the fruit and vegetables that are causing these health outcomes in the fruit and vegetable intake, or the amount of meat we're eating, or else like um, it's the not training the failure and, the, and the, the frequency and the volume in these exercise studies. It's like, uh, no, there's something else going on. So anyway, leave your question in the comments down below and let me know what do you want to hear in part two, and I'll talk to you all next time.